Okay, so <coughs> let's start with the last talk of this session, that is <coughs> on uh, uh, undecidability results concerning satisfiability of the uh, nomina subtyping. <coughs> and the speaker is Dmitry Mordivinov from uh, St. Petersburg State University. Does it work? Yeah, I think so. So, hello, I'm Dmitry from JetBrains Research and St. Petersburg State University. And my talk is about the first order satisfiability problem in the type systems of languages like Java, C Sharp, Scala, or Julia, as we already know. Uh, so, there is a very well known line of research starting at the beginning of this century and currently ending with a very bright work of Popol 2017. Actually, I wonder if Radu is attending right now. Oh, that's nice. So, it's very pleasant. So, I'm sorry I will not talk too much about your paper. But <clears throat> uh, so, the investigations have started in 2000 by Viroli who actually noticed that the majority of implementations of the type checking procedure in C++ compilers just would not always terminate. So, and he also, and he also has determined the sufficient condition for its termination and his idea was to constrain the shape of class tables. So, a class table is just a bunch of declarations, of so subtyping declarations in our program and we write it as usually uh, with uh, the object declare to the left and the uh, hierarchy to the right and they are separated with this nominal subtyping sign. Now, well, his idea was to just to throw away some class tables that do, that have some form of cycles in the type variable dependency graph. So, I will not dive into the details but just to give some intuition I would tell that this class table is okay regardless this C parameter occurs, regardless, regardless this C parameter occurs here at the right side. But if I add to the middle some other occurrence of C parameter, then we eventually can get into the situation while when during the type checking we get into a same kind of type, but the size of the type has grown. So, when we get, do some amount of type checking steps we actually can get the infinitely large types. And then later Kennedy and Pierce has published a very foundational paper where they have defined a very concise formal model of pure nominal subtyping with variance. And this model is actually used in this paper by Radu and we use this model as well. So, Besides this model, they have proved that there is no algorithm that takes two ground types, by ground I mean types without type variables, and decides if one type is a subtype of another while always terminating. And they also have noticed that if we throw away the contravariance, then the subtyping relation is decidable. And this is a very good starting point for us. So actually, if we have the subtyping and nominal type systems, we know that uh, this is undecidable, but we also know that if we throw away the contravariance or we throw away the expensive class tables, then we get a decidable subtyping relation. So, our work is about a bit another problem. So, this using, uh, so we just given a class table and we are given some first order formula. And the only thing we need to do is to decide if there is a ground substitution into a type variables of this formula which satisfies it or we need to prove that there is no such substitution. So, why do we care about this problem? Actually, our main source of motivation is the compositional verification of software. So, this talk is somehow connected with the keynote of Ilya Sergei or tomorrow keynote talk. So, Suppose we are given some function, the C sharp function, like in this example, and we want to prove that some code points are just unreachable. For example, uh, this line can throw the null reference exception, and let's try to prove that under all 
possible substitutions of this type variables, this null reference exception is unreachable. Well, now we could just try to write down this first order formula over the nominal types. And we just uh, can ask ourselves if it is satisfiable. And if it is satisfiable, then we have some substitution of these type parameters uh, that leads us to the exception. But if it is unsatisfiable, then we have managed to prove the safety of this line. And another, I would say, more strange source of motivation is the more advanced uh, type parameter constraint system. So actually, in practice, we would, all, we would sometimes have the functions uh, with some implicit contracts on type variables which we would like to prove, which we would like to prove statically. For example, we would want to statically prove that this exception never occurs. But the type parameter constraint system in such languages, in, in languages of like C sharp, are not expressive enough to specify those contracts. So, for example, here we need a disjunction that we don't have in, in C sharp. And if we have some effective decision procedure for the subtype sub problem, we, we could actually use, write the nominal types in the assertion language of the prover. And in this case, for example, we could use some deductive verifier like spec sharp, and we could write down those type constraints, the, the arbitrary first order type constraints over the nominal types. So this is a bit about our motivation, but now uh, let's go to the theory. So I have a few examples here. One, uh, let's start from simple, with a simple one. So we have this class table here. We have the covariant type J, and we have this constructor C, which inherits the J of C. Now, we also have this formula with three variables X and Y. And we want to find the ground type substitution to these variables that satisfies our formula. Essentially, what do we ask? We ask, are there two different supertypes of C? Now, easy. For example, this could be C and J of C, or it could be J of C and J of J of C. Why not? So this was an easy one, but let's go to this one. We have the same class table, but now we have a bit another query. So we still want to find two supertypes, but now they should be incomparable. Uh, so if we think a bit, we could come up with the idea that all supertypes of C are of this form. So this is a bunch of J's followed by the constructor C. And actually, all these types are comparable. So one is the subtype of another. So this formula is unsatisfiable. But note that we reasoned a bit in a bit more complex way than the, in the previous example. If in the previous example, we could just enumerate all possible type substitutions and check them. We have a non-expensive class table. Why not check the candidates while we find? In this one, we have applied some very complex style of reasoning. So, it's very interesting, could we come up with some decision procedure that determines the unsatisfiability of such queries automatically, even in the quantifier-free case? And I have a little bit more tricky example here. So here we have this class table with e inheriting e and j inheriting nothing, and these two constructors inheriting j. Uh, those are a bit similar, but they have two and three j's in their supertypes. So now, I ask, is there a common supertype of those two type constructors? Well, it's pretty obvious that all common supertypes are just um, some j's, actually a multiple of six times taken j's, and then followed by e. And we could generalize this example a bit, so we can have the arbitrary amount of natural numbers. And we ask actually the same question. Do these types have a common nominal supertype? But in this case, we have the same answer, but we have a multiple of the least common multiple of these numbers here. And we could complicate it a bit more by adding 
this super type of multiple of the product of these numbers times j followed by e. And then we just exclude the super types which are subtypes of this one. So we just exclude the solutions that are multiple of a product of our numbers. And so obviously now we have that phi is satisfiable if and only if our numbers are mutually co-prime. So this is already a bit scary, isn't it? We actually managed to encode the co-primeness into our set, subtype set problem. But even if we do not use the type constructors, we still have something meaning, meaningful because if we are given some arbitrary finite posit, we can, we could encode the existence of uh, this order embedding map from uh, our posit to a set of ground types determined by our class table by simply writing down this simple query. And it does not use the type constructors at all. Now, note that all these class tables are non-expensive. So if we get the decidable ground subtyping, within this case, the subtype set problem looks a bit more complex. And if you expect that this problem is undecidable, then I have done a good job because actually we have managed to show it by the reduction from post-correspondence problem. And this uses this tiny class table and this tiny formula. Um, and there are some things to note here, but I will just call them. So first of all, this class table is non-expensive. We have a type variable dependency graph in our paper. And you can also note that there are no type parameter. Uh, there is no, no con contravariant constructors here, so all the constructors are covariant with this plus. And also, all constructors depend on maximum one argument. So all constructors are unary or nullary. And our query does not have quantifiers, and it also does not contain the negations. So this discovers for us a very sad picture, because if in the ground subtyping problem we could just require throw away the contravariance or throw away the expansive class tables, we get the decidable subtyping relations. While in this first order satisfiability problem, even in the quantifier free case, if we take both constraints, and even if we add some more, we get an undecidable problem. So a good question to ask, why do we need such problem? So if, if this is so bad. But essentially the second part of our work is, uh, shows that it's not so bad actually. So we have provided some, if we add some additional constraints on the query, actually we could throw away all the constraints on the class table, except the expensiveness, of course. So a semi-ground fragment is just a set of formulas that consist only of semi-ground atoms, where the semi-ground atoms are the subtyping atoms without, with at least one argument, uh, without the type variables. So, for example, this is a semi-ground atom, while these two guys are not. <coughs> now, a uh, semi-ground formula consists only of semi-ground atoms, and we, we actually managed to prove that if we have uh, the semi-ground formula, then within the arbitrary non-expensive class table, the subtype set problem is decidable. So we have shown it by uh, using the theorem from Kennedy and Pierce paper about the finiteness of the inheritance and decomposition closure of finite set of types and using some ideas from the super, super compilation also. And note that this is a pretty, pretty, pretty practical fragment. So, because in practice we rarely write the constructors that uh, we rarely write the subtyping queries that match the types with two different type variables from both sides. So actually we could solve uh, this verification problem just if we don't use the queries with two different variables from do, on two different, different sides. Now, note also that this prime example is also semi-ground. So we have this AI and E 
on both sides. So actually, each instance of this problem can be solved completely automatically. But we don't know how to build an efficient procedure for that, an effective procedure. Yeah, so let me summarize my results. Um, so we have actually established the subtype set problem and we have managed to prove its undecidability and actually prove the undecidability of really remarkably small fragment. And we have also provided the a pretty practical decide, decidable fragment that constrains just the form of queries that almost doesn't constrain the class table. So it, it constrains, it, it, it poses only the expensive, non expensive is constrained that, for example, adopted in .NET. And uh, there are some future directions, and they're actually. Um, uh, so, so one direction is theoretical because we could just um, we pose only the constraints on the formulas but we could also throw away all the constraints on the formulas and just, pro just find some more practical constraints on the, on the class table. So another direction is to build a fragment that constrains only class tables. And Another very important direction is to build an, eff an effective decision procedure for this problem. Because actually then we could try to build a compositional uh, program verifier uh, of object-oriented languages like C-sharp. So I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for presenting our results. So we have time for questions. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, um, even though the problem is undecidable, um, and that means there are, there are certain, uh, well, what I'm wondering is, it, it does the undecidability cause a problem in practice, like in the kind of uh, programs that you might realistically come across? Um, maybe it's not so much of a problem, I don't know. So the question is, uh, does this undecidability influence the practical programs that we build? So, uh, actually I don't know. Uh, we have some very, we have some Fragments of, for example, standard.NET libraries, which use some multiple type parameters and use some multiple things uh, in their queries. For example, in the uh, system link queue, you can find a lot of subtyping, subtyping queries using this kind of uh, uh, using this kind of queries with both variables on both sides. But I don't know if you meet a lot of such things in the usual code. So. Actually, all the code that we write is inside the expensive fragment because if you try to write some non-expensive class table, your analyzer would probably die. Um, it's really funny to play with those class tables in the modern analyzers. But I don't know. So I think that this, uh, the undecidability does not influence too much uh, to the practical code because within this semi-ground fragment, we could analyze a lot of a lot of libraries, a lot of frameworks using the generic types, yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? Did you in your work come across queries that were not semi-ground? Where you need to say X smaller than Y or something like that? Uh, as I already said, we have encountered such... Uh, you have? Yeah, we have encountered such uh, examples in system link queue in the standard library of .NET, for example. Yeah, so there are such fragments. But actually, we could constrain the form of the class tables. Uh, we could we could use some more constraints on the class tables, and they are within, uh, those fragments are within those constraints but we failed to determine those constraints uh, and prove the decidability in that fragment yet. We did not do it yet.
Hi, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I, I assume by uh, an efficient decision procedure you mean a polynomial time algorithm, right? Or no, it's no? impossible because even checking the type checking in non-expensive class tables is already exponential. Right. Okay. So, that's, so, are, so my question was, are there, lower, are there lower bounds or are there proved lower bounds? I guess that's, so that's the answer. By efficient, but I mean that it should work in all practical cases. It okay. should just terminate. You should just be able to uh, uh, to, to uh -huh. get the results. Right. But you've implemented something, and and it sounds like presumably it's not efficient at the moment. Or, uh, um, we do not have the implementation yet at all. So we oh, are working okay, on right. it. Okay. But uh, I think what we have is pretty efficient in most, in the majority of fragments where do not have the generics. So, for example, if we get just types without type parameters, then this problem is already, already works in pretty efficient way. So it is already solved. We have some prototype solver, but uh, I, we are planning to integrate it into some SMT solver because actually those past conditions would also have some other mm -hmm. uh, type parameter constraints. So okay, thanks. Last question. Uh, other, other theories I wanted to see. There is a, a different approach to generics, which is called materials and shapes. Yeah, uh, but uh, I don't know much about this. Okay. I was hoping that the answer will be, if you go this direction, everything will be decidable. Probably. Yeah, actually there was some paper at Popol 2002 where uh, they have explored the decidability of the subtype sub problem for uh, the generic class type, uh, the type nominal type systems without the generics, but they have explored the, um, mm, they have explored the arbitrary formula, so they didn't, they didn't explore the quantifier free fragment in the queries. And it was also undecidable. So this implies the undecidability of subtype set, but it doesn't tell us too much because we rarely have those quantified specifications in the assertion language of the deductive verifier, for example. Of course, if we talk about the types. Okay, so thanks, Dimitri.